Jefferson Bethke, To Hell with the Hustle, Reclaiming Your Life in an Overworked, Overspent and Overconnected World. You're living the dream, on paper at least. Degree, check, job, check. And even your Instagram profile's on point. You've done everything right, so why do you feel more like a battery-operated robot than a fulfilled human being? Well, as it turns out, achieving cultural milestones often means signing up for a VIP pass to the Club of Anxiety and Loneliness. Look around you. More than half of millennials admit they're drowning in loneliness, while a staggering portion of both millennials and Gen Z are being hammered by anxiety and depression. Why? Because you've been duped into believing in a relentless pursuit of cool and fulfilling jobs, setting yourself up against absurdly high standards. It's no wonder you're working yourself to the bone. It's this insidious hustle culture that's gotten under your skin, warping work into a measure of your self-worth and not just a means to earn. But here's the kicker. This hustle, it's like a virus in your system. You've started worshipping at the altar of work, sacrificing your health, relationships and, well, everything. Really. But guess what? You don't have to keep grinding yourself down. This blink isn't just about exposing this life-draining hustle. It's your guide to breaking free and finding real meaning beyond the grind. And one way there is through the ways of Jesus himself. So, let's dive in and turn this chip around. Unshackle yourself from the chains of hustle culture. There's a new religion in town, and it doesn't involve pews or prayer books. It's the church of endless efficiency, where followers are disciples of to-do lists and prophets of productivity. But is this relentless pursuit of optimization really the path to enlightenment, or are you just running in circles? The reality is you're caught in a trap, and it's not just any trap. It's been meticulously designed by a culture that glorifies efficiency, productivity, and an illusion of limitless personal freedom. Admit it, you've scrolled through an endless barrage of life hacks and tips, each one promising to turn you into a productivity god. You hustle, you overwork, always pushing the envelope, trying to break free from those pesky human constraints. Sounds heroic, right? Wrong. It's a destructive cycle and you're smack in the middle of it. But where did this obsession come from? Well, first, let's look back to the Industrial Revolution, when machines redefined human achievement and set us on a path obsessed with efficiency and profit. Life boiled down to producing and consuming, with success measured by how much more people could do, regardless of the costs. Nature, cycles, rest, all thrown out of the window in this mad rush. What's the big deal, you ask? Well, in your relentless drive to do more and break every limit, your life has become a chaotic, burnout-inducing mess. You're chasing a form of freedom that leaves you void of meaning, purpose or direction. You're doing more, but at the expense of being more human. The good news is there's hope. Real success, the kind that matters, isn't about adding more to your already overflowing plate. It's about becoming more fully human and aligning yourself with the image of Jesus. The way out of this cycle is by ditching those traditional soul-crushing goal-setting models and replacing them with formations, intentional, rhythmic practices that shape your identity over time. These are the game changers, the habits, rituals and daily liturgies that'll mold you into the person you aspire to be. Not by sheer willpower or grit, but by gradual, consistent shaping. You're probably wondering, how do I start? Simple. Do an audit of your daily micro-rituals and check if they're building you up or dragging you down. Then begin integrating new practices into your life. There are five transformative practices to help you escape the hustle culture for good and step into a life that's truly human. And the first one involves turning down the volume. Practice number one, silence. You're living in a world where noise is the new normal. Think about it. Even your favorite coffee shop, the one that seems like a haven, is actually a cacophony of blaring music and the whir of machinery. 
Your brain, bless its resilient circuits, is working overtime, constantly filtering out this barrage of sounds. It's no wonder you feel perpetually drained. This unyielding overstimulation, believe it or not, is potentially nudging you closer to conditions like chronic fatigue or even schizophrenia. Yet, here you are, normalizing environments that are nothing short of sensory assaults. Restaurants, spin classes, nightclubs, these places are practically mirroring the noise levels used in torture techniques. Let's dive deeper. Ever thought about why you might shy away from silence? Could it be, perhaps, because you crave distractions? Silence and solitude aren't just quiet rooms. They're like graveyards where the pretenses of your life are laid to rest and the real, raw you is unearthed. It's confronting, almost like meeting yourself for the first time. But what if leaning into this discomfort, this deafening silence, is actually what you need? In that stillness, something miraculous happens. Your former identity starts to wither. It's in these moments of quiet that you start shedding those layers of false identity, getting closer to your authentic self and God. It's in the hush that you might just hear the divine and feel a sense of renewal washing over you, making way for a truth that fills, rewires, and recalibrates you. This isn't just any makeover. This is your identity being shaped, crafted in the likeness of Christ, coming alive anew. So, how do you start reclaiming silence in this noise-addicted world? Begin by seeking it out deliberately. Find a quiet minute or two in a secluded spot and guard it fiercely from the constant intrusions of life. Yes, indulging in silence will feel awkward and difficult initially. All spiritual practices do. But remember, learning these new practices takes patience and repetition. With time, you'll discover your rhythm and find yourself dancing through life with Jesus. Practice number two, refusal. Let's talk about time. Not the TikTok kind, but the kind that's reshaped your life, that hustles you along from morning to night. You've been racing against this relentless monster, cramming every minute with tasks, leaving yourself breathless. Being perpetually busy makes your life more meaningful. Right? Now, consider this non-stop lifestyle you're so proud of. It's not just exhausting, it's eating away at you. You've become so entangled in constant busyness that you're overlooking the essence of living. Your calendar is overflowing, squeezing out any breathing space and eclipsing the truly valuable moments of life. It blinds you to what's genuinely important, loving and serving those around you. Here's a radical idea. Start saying no. Yes, you heard right. Make no your default response instead of mindlessly agreeing to everything. In doing so, you'll create what's known as margin, that sweet spot between what you can actually handle and what you're currently taking on. Instead of being a slave to the clock, why not cultivate some breathing room? Allow space for interruptions, for those unexpected moments that really matter. Sure, it's easy for you to dream big, to plan grand missions. But what about the people right next to you? These grand plans often overshadow the simple yet profound act of loving your neighbours. Your community, your family, they're your real mission field, not some far-flung grandiose project. And while you're at it, ditch the glorification of overcommitment. It's a trap. Even in religious circles, this hustle culture is celebrated. But let's get real. Fulfilling small, everyday acts of kindness and love might just be what your faith truly calls for. Here's the bottom line. Time is the ultimate non-renewable resource. You can't buy more of it. You can't replace it. So start treating it like the gold it is. Stop squandering it on meaningless busyness. Rediscover the power of margin, the power of having the space to live. Remember, when you manage your time well, you're not just saving minutes, you're saving your soul. It's not just about slowing down. It's about choosing to live fully in each moment. Isn't it time you got started? Practice number three, obscurity. Have you ever felt the pressure of needing to be extraordinary? To constantly go after grand achievements and to bask in the limelight? 
Western culture idolizes ambition and productivity, urging you to live your best life and be the best you. But pause for a moment. What if the real treasure lies in living a life that's, well, seemingly boring and ordinary? In your unrelenting chase for extraordinary feats, you risk missing the profound richness and meaning found in a quieter, simpler life. You overlook the beauty of obscurity, where true intimacy with God and others can flourish. This obscurity, often perceived as mundane, dull and a waste of potential, is not a curse. It's a hidden blessing. Christ embraced obscurity during his hidden years and his time in the wilderness. He understood something vital, that the noise of public crowds could drown out God's voice. It's in the peaceful, unnoticed places where you can really tune into those divine whispers. Many other significant biblical figures like Moses, Abraham and Paul also spent long periods in relative unknownness before they were called for greater purposes. Moses, after fleeing to the wilderness, lived as a shepherd for 40 years. Abraham left his home to live in an unknown place in obedience to God's call. Paul, post-conversion, remained in obscurity in Arabia and Syria before embarking on his missionary journeys. Their lives exemplify that the mundane routines of daily schedules can be immensely fulfilling when guided by simplicity and peace. This isn't to say that striving for great things is wrong. Rather, it's a reminder that life's essence isn't about being spectacular. Chasing after extraordinary moments can actually distance you from the intimate joys found in an ordinary life. Your role is to be faithful in the small, unnoticed tasks. By embracing the simplicity and obscurity of life, you'll grow closer to God. And this, in its truest sense, is the real goal of living. Practice number four, rest. Imagine you're caught in a whirlwind of never-ending tasks and deadlines. In this incessant hustle, there's an ancient practice that offers a sanctuary of peace and joy, the Sabbath. Think of it as a weekly escape from the clutches of ceaseless productivity, a day where you can breathe freely, revel in delight, and celebrate life's simple pleasures. It's an act of defiance against the curse of perpetual labor, a gentle reminder to ground your identity not in your accomplishments but in something far greater. This tradition isn't a newfangled idea. It dates back to the dawn of creation itself. Picture the entire universe, freshly spun from the cosmos. And there, on the seventh day, even God paused, setting a precedent for all humanity. If you feel like you're in an endless battle against time, always trying to squeeze more out of each day, consider practicing the Sabbath. But don't just take it as a day off when you pause your work. Practicing the Sabbath doesn't mean you lie around, watch TV, and snack all day. It's actually an invitation to infuse your day with the essence of divine presence and to celebrate life. However, it also shouldn't be boring or something you feel forced to do. Know how Christmas fills people's hearts with warmth, bringing families together for feasting and joy? The Sabbath should feel like a mini Christmas, offering a space for togetherness and tranquility. Note that embracing this weekly holiday demands effort, much like shaping the magical Christmas, where you shop for gifts, wrap them with ribbons, plan your meals, send out invitations, and all that hullabaloo. You have to carefully plan the Sabbath too. But it's okay to not get it perfect on the first try. It's about slowly and deliberately building a tradition that weaves life-giving rhythms into your family's tapestry. At first, you'll find yourself yearning for your phone or computer, itching to get back to your work desk. Breaking free from these sirens requires a conscious choice to embrace a new way of being that aligns with the redemptive narrative of your life. It's a choice you need to actively seek week after week. Practice number five, empathy. You're on a journey to embody Christ's way of life, and a crucial part of this is learning to love and connect deeply with others. This journey isn't easy. It demands empathy, a quality that bridges gaps and draws you closer to those you might naturally clash with or even dislike. But ultimately, empathy is the antidote to conflict, the key to building a strong, supportive community. 
This is exactly what Daryl Davis, a musician, practiced to achieve something extraordinary. He managed to change the hearts of over 200 white supremacist Ku Klux Klan members. How? Not through arguments or judgment, but by sharing meals and conversations. He famously asked them, How can you hate me when you don't even know me? This simple question, rooted in empathy, broke down barriers and built connections. Empathy and human connection aren't new concepts. There were settlers captured by Native Americans who, upon returning to Western society, longed to return to the indigenous cultures. They missed the community-centric life, a stark contrast to the individualism prevalent in Western culture, which often leaves people feeling isolated. But here's the challenge. Technology and social media are eroding your empathetic instincts. Sensational and emotionally charged content dominates your news feed, and algorithms create echo chambers, reinforcing what you already believe. This digital landscape fuels division, creating tribes that oppose each other with vitriol rather than understanding. For Christians, the call to action is clear. You must resist the urge to instantly react and instead ask questions like, what do you mean by that? to foster better communication. Such patience allows you to understand before you judge. Remember, loving your enemies, embracing interruptions, and moving at the speed of grace. This was Jesus' way. He proved that you can walk fast enough to be purposeful, but slow enough to be open to interruption and see the pain of others. But it's only when you step away from the hustle and busyness that you can walk at such a pace. So, slow down, listen, and engage with an open heart. This is the path to truly living as Christ did, in a world that desperately needs more empathy and understanding. The main takeaway of this blink to To Hell with the Hustle by Jefferson Bethke is that hustle culture pushes you into an endless rat race, leaving you devoid of meaning and disconnected from others. The way forward is to realign yourself with the rhythms modeled by Christ. It's a journey that invites you into the beauty of silence, the power of saying no, the peace found in obscurity, the rejuvenation of rest, and the deep connection of empathy. While it may sound dull or overly simple, this path holds the key to rediscovering your humanity. So. Dare to step away from the hustle and find your true self. Okay, that's it for this blink. But before you go, did you realize you were listening to an AI-powered voice model? We're always looking for ways to evolve our content while bringing you more of the learning you love. And we've been experimenting with AI to do just that. We'd like to know what you think, so please leave us a rating and a quick comment so we can improve your listening experience even more. Thanks, and see you in the next Blink.